Amen. All right. So again, our first night is the plan of salvation. And I hope you guys enjoy. And again, if you have any questions, just let us know. All right. Picture the horror or, uh, of being trapped in a house as scorching flames and choking smoke closes in on you. Then imagine how grateful and relieved you feel to be plucked to safety. Well, the truth is that every person on the planet is in tremendous danger. We all, or excuse me, we all urgently need rescue, not by people in uniform, but by our Father in heaven. God loves you so much that he sent his son to save you. You've probably heard this before, but are you sure you understand what it's actually all about? What does it really mean and can it truly change your life? We're going to read on to find out. So does God really care about us? Does he, does he love us? And he, he, he showed that love uh, when he left heaven to, to come down to this world to die for us. All right. So the first question is, does God really care about you? In Isaiah chapter 43, verse 4, it says, Since thou was precious in my sight, thou hast been honorable. And I have loved thee, therefore I will give men for thee, a people for thy life. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 3, it says, uh, The Lord hath prepared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love, therefore with loving kindness have I drawn thee. The answer is, says, God's never-ending love for us is far beyond human understanding. He would love us even if we were the only lost soul in the world. And Jesus would have given his life for us even if there had been no other sinner to save. Never forget that we are precious in his sight. He loves you and cares about you deeply. And you know, that is a wonderful promise because Satan would have us all to believe that, you know, we're already lost. Uh, he would have us to believe that we're wretched and we uh, there's no coming back from the things that we have done in our past. But Jesus says that all we have to do is ask for forgiveness. All we have to do is to get on our knees and repent of the sins. And he's willing to forgive us of those sins. But, you know, the way Satan kind of words things, he's very tricky. He's very deceptive. And he wants us to believe that we're so bad that God will not forgive us and God does not love us. God loves us with an everlasting love and an unconditional love. And I am so happy uh, that he, uh, you know, came down to this earth and, and gave his son to shed his blood for us. Number two, how has God demonstrated his love for you? And we all know this verse, John 3, 16, and we could probably say it all together verbatim. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And do we truly understand what this means? You know, uh, this is probably a, a one of the most famous scriptures, uh, but do we really understand that God gave his son, his only son, his only begotten son? And, you know, that was something, you know, to give his only son. And, you know, as humans, you know, we, we think about that. Uh, we think about our only child, our only son, and if something would ever happen to them, uh, how that would make us feel. But God gave his son to die for you and me. And a lot of times we, we make light of it. You know, he gave his son, Jesus came down, he died a horrible death. But then as humans, we still continue in our sin. We still want to cling to, to, the, to the evils of this world, not realizing what Jesus did and what God did by giving his son to die for us. So, you know, as we read these scriptures, let it not be a cliche. But let it, you know, really prick our hearts to understand what God did by giving his son and what Jesus did by dying for all of us on the cross. First John 4, 9 through 10, it says, in this was manifested the love of God towards us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. You know, one of the things that I, I really want to talk about before um, I'm going to answer the question, but I want to really address this. The answer is says, but God loves you so deep because God loves you so deeply. He was willing to send his only son to suffer and die rather than be separated from you 
from you for eternity. It might be difficult to fully grasp that kind of abundant love, but God did it for you. Um, and so do we take that for granted? That's the question we only can ask within ourselves. Do we take for granted uh, what Jesus did for us, what God did for us to, to you know, this is the whole plan uh, to save us, you know, sending his son to die for us. But do we take it for granted? And that's something that we really have to ask. And another question I want us to think about, God showed his love by sending his son. He's proven that he loves us. But the real question is, do we truly love him? Do we truly love him? Uh, the Bible says in John chapter 14, verse 15, that if we love God, we will keep his commandments. Uh, so what is love? What is it? What, what does the Bible definition of love? If you have your Bibles this, um, this evening, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I like to go over this and, and, you know, and even in your leisure time, um, you know, um, if you're just wanting to read and open up the scriptures, um, look at what love, the, the Bible's definition of love it is really, um, it, when I first read it, it was really mind blowing. So let's go to 1 Corinthians and we're going to look at the, uh, chapter 13. Now, I'm not going to read all of it because, um, of, because of time. Uh, but I'm just going to read a couple of verses. But the whole uh, chapter of 1 Corinthians 13, it talks about love. And the word in, in uh, the King James Version is what I'm reading from. The word is charity, but charity is, is love, okay? It says, Through I, though I speak with tongues of men and of angels, I have not charity, meaning I have not love. I am become as a sounding brass or a twinkling, twinkling symbol. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all the mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove, mountain, move, remove mountains and have not charity, love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my good de uh, go goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not love, charity, it profits me nothing. And so in verse four, it tells us what love is, what charity is. Charity suffereth long. Charity is patient, is kind. It envieth not. Charity vaunted not itself. It is not puffed up. Uh, doth not believe itself unseemingly. Seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil. I'm just gonna stop there. You can get the gist of it. Uh, but in other words, what this is saying in the first part is that I can have all the knowledge in the world, but if I don't have love, it means nothing. And as Christ came down to this earth, he proved his love because in when you see in verse four, it says it envieth not. It is uh, not puffed up, meaning arrogant. OK, it um, it seeketh his uh, it seeketh not her own, meaning it's not selfish. So if we're, you know, if we have a selfish nature, that is not love. That is not the love that, you know, the Bible talks about. So uh, I'm not going to read all of that, but continue reading it on your own. And um, it is, is very educational of what the Bible's definition of love is. And I, I find it very interesting only because the world's definition of love does not match what the Bible's definition and what God's definition of love is. So please do take the time to read that. All right, question number three, how could he love someone like me? And of course, Satan would want us all to think that. You know, we have done so horrible. We have sinned so much. How could he love someone like, like me? Well, he does. In Romans 5, 8, but God commanded his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, he still died for us. Christ died for us. That's how much he loves us. Answer, certainly not because anyone deserves it. No one person has ever earned anything except the wages of sin, which is death. And you can read that in Romans 6.23. But God's love is unconditional, meaning no matter what we do, he still loves us. He loves those who have stolen, those who have committed adultery, and even those who have murdered. He loves those who are selfish, those who are hypocritical, and those who are addicted. No matter what you have done or what you are doing, he loves you and he wants to save us from sin and its deadly consequences. 
That's why I love Jesus so much, because he loves the sinner, but he hates the sin. And as, as long as we have breath in our lungs and, you know, we continue in this life, we can go to Jesus. And he said he will help us with a particular sin that we're dealing with. And as we accept them in our hearts and in our lives, he said he will remove those sins away from us. He loves us so much that he will go do anything for us, including giving his life. Question number four, what did Jesus's death do for me? And that's a good question to ask all of us. You know, um, did Jesus's death mean anything to any of us? You know, did he die on the cross? Was it in vain? And that's a good question. It says here, behold, what manner of love the father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God, 1 John 3, 1. As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. And that's in John chapter one, verse 12. And we have to believe in his name to get through this world. There's so much that has taken place. And, and you know, the Bible talks about it, uh, the world being in gross darkness, you know, and that's where, that's where we are these days. You can see it all around us. It says Christ died to satisfy the death penalty against us. He was born as a man so he could suffer the kind of death all sinners really deserve. See, we all deserve death because of the sins that we commit. But Jesus came down and he paid the penalty, which was his life, so that we may have eternal life. Uh, you know, if we took that and we just threw it away, we're, I mean, how would Jesus feel about that? He came down, he died a horrible death so that we can have eternal life and we constantly continue pushing him away. You know, I, I understand, you know, even as a human, it would hurt us. If somebody that we love so much turned our back on us and pushed us away and said, we don't want you. And I just imagine Jesus going through all of this uh, just to make sure that we have a chance to make it to heaven and we continue pushing him away. We continue to push his word away. We continue to push the truth away. And brothers and sisters, in the end, it's not going to do anything but hurt us. It says, and now today, he offers to give you the credit for what he did. His sinless life is credited to us so that we can be counted as righteous. Amen. His death was accepted by God as full payment for your wrongs. And when we accept what he did as a gift, we are taken into God's own family as his child. Amen. You know, um, I share this a lot. You know, Christ allowed, uh, allows us to use his name even though we're not worthy. You know, when you hear the word Christian, it means Christ-like. And so, you know, for me, I know that I'm not like Christ. I'm trying to be like Christ. But even with that, he says, I'm going to allow you to use my name, being a Christian, because I love you so much. He wants us all to be saved. And, you know, as we continue in this life, we have to understand the penalty that was paid. We understand that his death was a lot more than what we really think. You know, they have all these movies that are, you know, that are out and, People are watching them, but, you know, we need to open up the word of God to understand everything that Jesus went through so that we may have eternal life. All right. So number five, how do we receive Jesus and pass from death to life? Uh, we're talking about a spiritual death here. And just admit three things. One, I am a sinner. All have sinned in Romans 3, 323. Number two, I am doomed to die. The wages of sin is death. Romans 6, 23. Number three, I cannot save myself. Uh, without me, you can do nothing, Jesus says. And that's in John chapter 15, verse five. So we have to admit three things. Now we have to believe in the uh, three things. Uh, the first thing we need to believe in is that he died for me and you, uh, that Jesus might taste death for everyone. Hebrews 2, 9. Uh, he forgives me. Um, and this is another, um, you know, really important text that, you know, a lot of people know. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. We have to confess our sins, brothers and sisters. We also have to repent of our sins. Then we have to overcome that sin. Um, you know, coming to Jesus, that is the first step. And so the repentive part is a heart condition. Only you and him know. If we have truly repented of a sin that we have committed, it is our heart. 
And then we, uh, once we recognize that, okay, we've sinned, we come to Jesus, we confess our sins to him, we have to repent of those sins, and then we have to overcome those sins. But first, we have to come to him, and we have to confess. Number three, he saves me. He who believes in me has everlasting life. That's John chapter 6, verse 47. All right, so answer. Consider, uh, consider these life-changing truths. Because of my sins, I am under a death sentence. I cannot pay this pen penalty without losing eternal life. I would be dead forever. I owe something I cannot pay. But Jesus says, I will pay the penalty. I will die in your place and give you credit for it. You will not have to die for your sins. What a wonderful friend we have in Jesus. The question is, what are we doing with that life that he died for? You know, we talk about Jesus, you know, dying a horrible death and the things that he went through. And he went to Calvary and he died on Calvary for us. You know, so what are we doing with that life that he has given us? We have to be mindful, brothers and sisters, because, you know, the life he has given us is to be a witness for him. It is to share his word, to live the life as Jesus lived. And so, you know, with the life that we have, you know, a great uh, price was bought for it, and that was his death. And so I just want us to all keep that in, in, in mind. All right. So um, what I like to do now is talk about what sin is, you know, um, just to make sure that we all, all have a clear understanding. What is sin? In 1 John 3, 4, it says, whosoever committed sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is transgression of the law. We're talking about God's law, God's Ten Commandment law. OK, so when we break God's law, his Ten Commandments, it is considered sin. First, John three, eight, nine. He that committed sin is of the devil for the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the son of God was manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin for his seed remaineth in him. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. All right. If you again, if you have any questions on these, please email us. So, what are the different trespasses in God uh, in, 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 against God? You know, when you read in um, Psalm chapter thirty-two, verse five, David really points out the three trespasses against God, and we're going to talk about them because they all are different. Okay. And I know you're looking like, well, sin is sin, and that's correct, but they all are different. So, sin means to miss the mark, in this case, God's mark. This trespass against God could be intentional or unintentional. This trespass mainly dealt with the Gentiles or unbelievers. So in other words, brothers and sisters, sometimes we can do something and we may not know it's a sin, okay? And the Bible tells us that at a time of ignorance, God winks at the things that we do because we don't know. All right. So sin could be either intentional or unintentional. And that's why it's very important to study our Bibles so that we do not miss the mark. Amen. Then we have transgression. Transgression refers to presumptuous sin. It means to choose to intentionally disobey God. This is willful trespassing. This is willful sin. What is presumptuous sin? Presumptuous sin means um, I'm going to go out to the grocery store. Um, my family doesn't have any food, but I'm, a, I'm going to go steal some food so we can eat. And I'm going to pray and ask God to forgive me later on. We're presuming that God is going to forgive us when we know better and we do it anyway. OK, that's presumptuous sin. So we can't live that kind of life that uh, I'm going to go ahead and break God's commandment and I'm going to ask for forgiveness later. OK. Uh, so that doesn't work in, in, in with God. We have to understand he wants us to be obedient to his word. So, you know, having presumptuous uh, sin in our lives is very, very dangerous. The third one is iniquity, and this is the worst of all. Iniquity is premeditated trespass against God and continuing to do so without repentance. Iniquity is like first degree murder. We planned it. We woke up in the morning thinking about doing evil. OK, um, knowing all the ramifications, we're still going to follow through with it. So just like in the court system, you have first degree murder, second degree, third, so on. When it's first degree murder, 
you get the worst sentence because you planned it out. You were, you know, you were uh, saying you knew what you were doing. And so you're going to get the worst sentence. So iniquity is along those lines. OK. All right. So this plan of salvation, it says I accept his offer the moment I acknowledge my debt and accept his death for my sin, I become his child. Simple, isn't it? So when we understand the sinful conditions that we are, and we're trying to remove that out of our hearts. We go to Jesus, we ask for forgiveness, and we repent of our sins. And then when we accept his, his, um, his life, when we accept him in our life, we become his child. And that is so wonderful because right now, brothers and sisters, we need Jesus more than ever. Number six, what must we do to receive this gift of salvation? All right. It says we are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, Romans 3.24. A man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law, Romans 3.28. The only thing we can do is to accept salvation as a gift. Our works of obedience will not help us to be justified because we have already sinned and deserve death. But all who act in faith for salvation will receive it. The worst sinner is accepted just as completely as the one who sins the least. Our past does not count against us. Remember, God loves everyone alike and forgiveness is simply for the asking. By grace, we have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. In other words, there's nothing we can do to be saved. It's all by the grace of God. By accepting his gift of salvation, we can be saved. There's nothing we can do in our power, brothers and sisters. It is only by Jesus Christ. Number seven, when you join his family through faith, what change does Jesus make in your life? If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That's in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Answer, when we receive Christ into our heart, he begins the process of destroying our old sinful self and changing us into new spiritual creation. Joyfully, we begin to experience the glorious freedom from guilt and condemnation. And the old life of sin becomes repulsive to us. We should get to a point, brothers and sisters, where Jesus is so embedded in us that we would rather die than to sin against him. That's how our nature should be. We would rather die than to sin and to, to put Jesus through any pain or hurt. We would rather die. And that's, that's the part we, we, we really need to get to. Well, it's kind of difficult because of our selfish natures. We love sin. You know, we, we, we cling on to it, and sometimes it's hard to let go. But we have to, if we want to see Jesus in peace, we have to, if we want to be in heaven with Jesus. And he wants us to be there for eternity. And so we have to get to a point where we can push sin away and run from it, just like the Bible says. It says, we will, <clears throat> we will see that one minute with God provides more happiness than a lifetime of being the devil's slave. What an exchange. Why do people wait so long to accept it? And a lot of it is because of Satan's deception. You know, he can make uh, something seem so attractive. He can make it seem something like, you know, we're really happy, but we're dying inside. And that's how Satan works. But giving our lives to Jesus is the best thing in the world. We, that's where true happiness is the only place can be found. Number eight. Will this change life really be happier than your old sinful life? Jesus said, these things I have spoken to you that your joy may be full. John 15, 11. If the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. I have come that they, might, uh, that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. John 10, 10. Answer. Many feel that the Christian life will not be a happy one because of self-denial. The exact opposite is true. When we accept the love of Jesus, joy springs up within us. Even when hard times come, the Christian can enjoy God's assuring and powerful presence to overcome and to help in the time of need, Hebrews 4, 16. And that is so true. 
You know, uh, a lot of times you'll find the world um, is only around Jesus when times are good, but when times are bad, we seem to push him away and we crawl under a rock or under our sheets and we hide and, and we try to fix things ourselves. But he says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And he's talking about a spiritual rest. And so that type of rest, that type of joy, we can only get through Jesus Christ. A lot of us here, we're probably going through some very, very hard and detrimental life-changing situations right now, even as we speak. And Jesus is the only one that can give us peace. He's the only one that can help us to get through all of these things. You know, we, we, we hear about the, the things that is taking place in the world with depression and anxiety and mental illnesses and, you know, people living a hard life. And, and the, the, you know, the world and what Satan is doing is he's saying, you know what, you don't have to deal with this. Just take your own life. You know, you don't have to do this. Just crawl into a bottle and drink yourself to death. But Jesus says, no, I have a better place for you. Come unto me and I will help you. And sometimes we get so arrogant and so selfish that we don't want to go to Jesus because we think we can fix everything ourselves. He says, no, I have a plan that will save you. The plan will work only if we accept it as a free gift. Number nine, does this mean that even the Ten Commandments will not be hard to obey? John 14, 15, it says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. That's how we know if we love Jesus. He says, I don't know if you love me if you keep my commandments. So you know what, brothers and sisters, one of the things we probably need to do is go back and look and read what God's Ten Commandments are. You know, um, and the Bible, the scriptures is there. If you, if you really want to know, uh, it's in Exodus chapter 20. Uh, but they're all throughout the Bible. Uh, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. First John 5, 3. Whosoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. First John 2, uh, chapter 2, verse 5. We're going to be um, later on, not today, but later on, we're going to be talking about God's Ten Commandments. Uh, so I hope you guys stick around. The answer is says the Bible ties obedience to a genuine love for God. Christians will not find it wearying to keep the Ten Commandments. With all our sins covered by Jesus' atoning death, our obedience is rooted in his victorious life within us. Because we love him so deeply for changing our life, we will actually go beyond the requirements of the Ten Commandments. We will regularly search the Bible to know his will, trying to find more ways of expressing our love for him. Whatever we ask, we will receive from him because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. Amen. First John 3, 22. The, you know, that last statement uh, of scripture where it says we do the things that are pleasing in his sight. What that should tell us, brothers and sisters, is that we should not have such a selfish nature that we're only looking out for us and what's good for us. We don't really know what's good for us or we wouldn't be in the condition that we're in. If we search the scriptures, Jesus will tell us. He will tell us what we need to do and what is pleasing in his sight and what his will is. You know, um, the Bible tells us that, you know, we are, you know, can be fools and are, are smart in our own eyes, but we're actually fools. Uh, we're fools to even think that we know what Jesus is, you know, wants us to do or what's best for us. He knows. He created us. And so it is only, you know, by the grace of God that we're here. But while we're here, we should put, be putting 100 percent of everything into our life and pleasing Jesus. And he'll take care of us. Number 10, how can you let everyone know about your life changing relationship with, with him, with Jesus? We were buried with him through baptism unto death that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life, that the body of sin might be done away with, Romans 6, um, 4 and 6. I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ, in 2 Corinthians eleven twelve. 12. Um, so in this scripture here, um, you'll notice, and especially when we get into prophecy, that Christ is the husband and the church, which is the people, are the bride. And it says he's going to come um, as, you know, the bride adorned for her husband. He's going to come 
uh, to receive his bride, his church, his people, to take us back home with him. So he uses the marriage analogy to symbolize um, his relationship with his true people. And we're going to, we have some deeper studies that we're going to get into. All right. So answer, baptism symbolizes three significant components in the life of one who accepts Christ. Number one, death to sin. Um, you know, you hear a lot of times people, you, you know, that are um, getting baptized, they're baptizing and they call it the watery grave because when they come up, they're there to be a new creature in, in Jesus Christ. Uh, but again, brothers and sisters, if our hearts are not changed, if we're not doing the things that Jesus is asking us to, to uh, asking us to do, uh, baptism means nothing if we're not changing our hearts. Uh, the only difference is we will come up a, a wet center instead of a dry center. So understand something, the heart, it starts right here. But baptism is, is so important as well uh, to giving, you know, um, our lives to Jesus and to overcome sin. Number two, birth to a new life in Christ. Three, a spiritual marriage with Jesus for eternity. This spiritual union will grow stronger and sweeter with time, so long as we continue in love. All right, God seals our spiritual marriage. To seal our spiritual marriage with Jesus for eternity, God has promised never to forsake you. Psalms 55, 22, Matthew 28, 20, Hebrews 13, 5. He promises to take care of you in sickness and in health. That's Psalms 41, 3 and Isaiah 41, 10. And to provide for your every need that could possibly develop in your life. Matthew 6, 25 through 34. Just as we received him by faith, keep on trusting him for every future need and he will never let us down. Um, this information is in a study guide. That's why we need your information. If you, um, if you register by sending us your, your name and address and stuff, we can get you the study guide and that way you can have this information for yourself. So as we continue this uh, Christian journey, we have to understand a few things. God. He does have a plan to save us, but we have a part to play in this too. We just can't sit on the couch and ex accept, you know, expect for salvation to fall in our lap. We have to do our part as well. So God has a part and we have a part. So what is God's part? God's part is that he draws us to him. Okay. And you can see the script, uh, scripture on the screen. Then uh, our part is we should not resist his drawing. When God is calling us to do something, when the Holy Spirit comes upon our hearts and our minds, we should not resist it. Don't push it away. We need to accept it and follow the Holy Spirit. He will convict us of our sin. John 16, 8. Our knowledge, uh, we have to acknowledge our guilt and we have to acknowledge that we need him. He will give us repentance when we ask him, when we truly repent in our heart, he'll know that and he will give us true repentance. But our part is we have to uh, confess our sins, then we have to forsake it, meaning not go back and doing it again. <clears throat> God's part, he will forgive, cleanse, and free us to live a sanctified life. And that's where we're trying to live. So. There's a process as Christians, we go through the justification, we go through the sanctification, and then eventually we get to the glorification when we all get to go to heaven. So we have to live uh, a sanctified life, but he can give us that. But what is our part? We have to believe and accept that he has and will do this for all of us. We have to believe it. God's part, he will make a way of escape when we are tempted. Satan is on his job, brothers and sisters. My friends, he knows. He knows what our weaknesses is. He knows how to push our buttons. So in every situation, God will make a way of escape. But, you know, we can't double guess what God is doing. We have, once we see what Satan is doing, we have to run from it. We have to take God's way of escape and submit to him. So as, you know, we continue this life, God has a plan to save us. We just have to understand and know what that plan is so we can accept it as a free gift. And as I close, the question is, 
Would you like to accept Jesus into your life right now and begin experiencing a new life in Jesus Christ? Brothers and sisters, if there's anyone listening on the call, you don't, I know some of us are kind of shy, but if you want to give your life to Jesus today, if you want to continue taking our studies, if you want to, you know, uh, you know, if he's impressed upon your heart to, to be baptized in his church, uh, please raise your hand on the screen. Let all of heaven know. Or you can email us and contact myself or call us. Uh, we'll love to pray and continue to study with you. Um, if you're wanting, if you've been baptized and you want to rededicate your life to Jesus, please contact us for more information. And you can email us and, and uh, at the email on the screen, and you can even call us. Uh, but brothers and sisters, right now, there's no time to play. Jesus is coming soon, whether we like it or not, or whether we know it or not. But we have to be prepared for his soon coming. And I hate for us to, you know, walk through this life thinking that we're saved, thinking that everything is good. When we have a work to do, we have a work to do in allowing Jesus to come into our heart uh, to change us. Uh, so that we can be prepared for his soon coming. And so, you know, please do not make light of this. Uh, it, it, it will be very detrimental that we get this far. And then all of a sudden, we don't make it to heaven because we were not willing to take the extra step in reading and studying our Bibles, getting on our knees and praying to the Lord. It would make, it, I mean, that would hurt Jesus so much. He wants us all to be prepared. So if you would like to be, you know, uh, take studies, continue, uh, coming to the seminar that we're doing, uh, please, please join us. Again, if you um, have any questions, you'll see the um, information here. Please reach out to us. If you like to donate, please, um, you can do so. Uh, this money goes to material. It goes to winning souls for Jesus Christ. Um, and again, uh, before we have closing prayer, um, if you haven't registered, please make sure you register. Um, we would like to send you some free materials. Uh, we only can do that with the home address. And I know the times are crazy nowadays, but your information is very confidential. We're not passing it out to anyone, uh, but we would like to send you some you know, information, some free gifts. And again, if you uh, come to every seminar, we'll, we would like to uh, present you a free King James Bible. Um, so um, at this time, uh, we're going to close out with prayer. But I want to thank you for coming to our first night of the Amazing Bible Truths. Uh, we'll, we'll be joining again this Thursday um, at uh, 7 p.m. And we're going to be using the same Zoom link. Uh, so please come. And if you have any prayer requests, uh, please, um, you know, uh, email us here at this email address. If you have any questions, email us here at Three Angels Ministries, ABT at gmail.com. And we will definitely be getting with you. But if you need anything, please let us know. All right. So at this time, let's have a, a closing word of prayer and we can consider ourselves.